Good evening. We're in Ecclesiastics. The name of this title is A Good Question. We're going to be looking at a couple of different scriptures in chapter 1. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity to come before you and to partake of your word. We ask that you be with Kitty since she's not feeling well, feeling pretty bad. So, Lord, we pray you raise her up. We just ask that you be with each and every one of us as we come before you seeking your perspective and your presence and your teaching. We just thank you and praise you for all your love and your grace. And we just ask that you be glorified and this message be anointed. And we say this in your name. Amen. We've been looking at Ecclesiastics. Uh, we see that the man who is writing it, we believe that Solomon calls himself a pastor. <clears throat> Excuse me. A good pastor also is a philosopher in a way because they think about and meditate upon the things of life. And as a preacher, they answer those questions in light of Scripture. Now, this pastor is speaking because of experiences, and he it allows him to speak honestly about the things that will be brought out in this book. And people, the one thing that our experiences with God should allow is that liberty to speak freely with authority about what we have experienced in light of wisdom from above. And wisdom can be the only one that can bring the proper instruction to us about those experiences. And if we don't have wisdom that brings that proper instruction to us, then we may have knowledge, but it's not going to do us any, any good. So the title is A Good Question. So we've looked at his introduction. We've looked at his findings. Now we're going to look at a good question he's going to ask. See, you ask questions so that people will stop and pause. And then you challenge them so they will meditate and think about it. There has to be a point where man really connects to the reality of things. And a lot of times man refuses to connect to the reality so that he can create his own reality. Now, as I said, philosophers will ask the questions in light of man's mortality. That's what you have to understand about philosophers. They ask in light of man's mortality. But a preacher will answer that question in light of eternity. And that's the uniqueness of these two different types of individuals, how they approach. Because what they show man in his mortality is he's not God. And what preachers show man in light of eternity, there is a God. He's real. And so as we look at this, we begin to realize that our mortality is what causes life to become one big question. And it's often followed by other questions, but it leaves that great question mark in our life. We ask, does life make sense? It doesn't unless there's something past this life, this world as we know it. It doesn't make sense. That's why so much of this present life seems like it's vanity because past it, if there isn't something past it, it is all vain. Now, <clears throat> the questions will be asked 
And they must be asked if there's going to be any answers. See, most people aren't curious enough to ask the questions. And the other part about it is they have to have enough reality around them that they know what questions to ask. If man doesn't deal in reality, he doesn't know what to, what, what to ask. And what it leaves him is in this hopelessness. Well, this is just the way it is, or there is no hope past this. Because he doesn't know what to ask because he's not connecting to reality. A wise man connects to reality so he can ask the right questions. A fool never does. And what you find out about a fool is you rarely ask any questions. Now, questions will be asked. They must be asked if there's going to be any answers to be had at all. And of course, most do not ask the real pertinent questions because ignorance in many cases is preferred. Man prefers his own reality. He doesn't really want to know. Now, people who do not want to know live for the day. They often live for the moment. And they don't look down the road because they might have to get serious about the matters of life and really begin to ask some questions and ponder the essence of their own life. And that's a very fearful thing because if you want to live your own life and do your own thing, you can't afford to know there's something more about your life there's something more about the reason why you're here. And it may not be for yourself. Their attitude a lot of time is, and you have to understand this is all about attitude really. We will live for the day and the moment. We don't look down the road because we might have to get serious. We're here just to have fun, fun, fun. Which can prove to be, of course, the greatest of all vanities, if it's not balanced out. And today, it's not balanced out at all. It's all about attitude. Remember that word. Attitude affects our behavior. And a lot of times the people's attitude is, don't throw a wrench into my little reality because I don't care past this moment. I don't want to care past this moment. I don't want to look down and care what's going to happen down the line. But if you're a pastor you're able to say to them, oh yes, you will in due time. In due time, you will care. When you begin to pay the consequences, when you begin to reap the bitterness, when you begin to see the fruits, how dead and lifeless, and hopefully you'll be wise enough to see it better matter to me. I better care past this moment. Because if you don't, you may not care now, but you're going to care in hell. And it'll be too late. We have to be realistic about these things. Only a fool will say it does not matter. The foolish will pause, but excuse it away. The ridiculous, and we met those, will laugh, that nervous laugh. They'll, they'll be a bit shaky because silently they're thinking, what if? 
And the scorner, well, they're going to mock it all and declare only the weak, the dumb, the stupid would buy such an insipid lie, believe, it's a, believe such fable, fables and myths that there's something past this world. But we are to be wise people as believers. We don't know there is a God. There is an existence past this world. And all mortal man comes up against in this world is vanity. And that's what with the last week the, the philosopher declared his findings. Actually, the preacher. What are they? Well, verse 2, vanities of vanities, saith the preacher, vanities of vanities, all is vanity. Now, we looked at the vanity. Everything of the world, the flesh, is vanity. It leads to vanity. That's all it can produce. It ends up being vain in the end, useless, without purpose. In the end, it leaves a soul void of hope, the spirit lean and lifeless. That's the reality of vanities. And yet man still insists on pursuing what they know is vain, leaving the soul behind and thinking, well, there is hope for me. I'll find something out there. There is nothing out there but vanities. Yet man will pant after them. He will seek them out with all of his heart. Whether driven by obsessions, seduced by attractions of this world, or deluded by the pride of life, they believe that they have a right to or deserve or have earned such vanities and that somehow it's going to make it all right and all well. Excuse me, i got to get Kleenex here. Now, we come down to some very interesting things that you have to look at because the logic behind these people's thinking that think vanities are worth pursuing is that that's their way of getting the most out of the world. That's their way of getting the most out of the world. If all is vanity in the flesh, why not live it up? That's their thinking. Their logic continues on. If all is vanity of this world, why not pursue it? Why not partake of it? As much as I want, why deprive myself of vanity? A lot of times when you challenge your, the young people and say, you know what, that's useless, that's a, a waste of time, excuse me, can't quite take care of that. Yeah, excuse me. Just need some. There I go. I hate to do that. But they will often look at you, young people, and say, you just don't want me to have fun. You want me to be like you. You want me to be some nun or monk in this world. You see, the problem is beyond the world we live in. We all, it all brings us back to a holy God. It brings us past the world into eternity facing judgment. That's what people don't get. They don't want to get it. They want to excuse themselves. 
of vanity. They want to excuse themselves as to why they chase after vanity instead of God, why declaring they're, they're Christians, while declaring they want everything God has for them, but they want the vanity of the world. They are a dichotomy, but are they really? Their problem is they don't love God with all their heart. They don't trust God with their faith. They don't believe God with their life. They are people of unbelief. Please hear me. You can say you believe God, you love God, but if you don't believe him, you really don't know him. You don't love him because he says, if you love me, obey me. We need to be honest with ourselves, but we live in this sort of bubble of vanity about ourselves, high opinions about ourselves. The Bible says not to think so highly of ourselves that we ought to, but we always do. Because we want to believe we are those committed people to God. Well, underneath, what we prefer above all else is our way to have our way with vanity. We have to be honest, and to be honest, we have to be ready to repent. We often think, people think, why deprive myself? Why deprive myself? Because so often life seems like a big bad joke. The question is, does your life show something of importance? And if not, if your life doesn't show something of importance, that's the greatest vanity of all because it's a waste of life, breath, and purpose. You're wasting space, people. Most of us are wasting space. Okay? Because we all want it on our terms. And the more we seek vanity, the more aimless we become in our life. And we're like some cork on the ocean that's just being tossed back and forth by the waves of the world, eventually to be swallowed up, to sink into oblivion of some kind. That's the end of mortality, but not the end of a soul. Now, the main purpose behind a philosopher is to ask the main questions that others fail to ask. What is the purpose of life and the purpose for life? Why are we here? What are we doing here? The preacher's responsibility is to answer such questions because they have the answer. We have the answer. But once again, they can only answer in light of eternity. The contrast has to be brought between the seen and the unseen. It's the only way to answer the question. We have to answer it in light of design. We forget that. We look at too much of what we think constitutes life and we forget to look at the design. You see, the design tells you what something is for. If we do not understand why man has been designed, we do not understand why he's here. How did God design us? What did God form in us? Without answering those questions, everything is going to look vain to us. Man must be designed with a purpose or his life will be found to be vain. We don't get that. 
We think life is all about experiencing and feelings and desires. No, it's about design. If we don't understand why we've been formed, how we've been formed, for what, we're missing our whole purpose for being here. God designed us with a purpose. The unseen designed us with a mission. We have to get back to it to understand their potential, our calling, to discover substance in life, or it all becomes meaningless. There's no meaning to it whatsoever. Then we become lost. When we say man's lost, it's because he has no idea why he's here. He has no concept of design, that he's been designed. He's lost to his potential. He's lost to his creator. We have to come back to that which is eternal. Man has to understand the one who designed him. The one who created him with purpose and calling to understand the reason for his life. Man has to come back to the only source of his life, his creator, his God, to make sense out of his life. And man refuses to. Man wants to think he's his own creator. funny how man wants to think he's his own creator when he can't even create anything without other things that God has made. So clearly vanity brings us back to the end of existence on this earth. It brings us back to the fact that we have to look up knowing that man is designed to fit into the scheme of something far greater than he can imagine. You can't even begin to imagine it. So anything outside of this revelation, this reality will prove uh, to be senseless. Void of form and meaning and purpose, bringing Bitterness to man's soul. That's why man is bitter in the soul. Because he works all of his life to gain some dream, the American dream. He works all of his life to get a house, have a family. And in the end, it all seems vanity. That's what midlife crises are about. Midlife crisis is because I met a man, for instance, a man who's worked all of his life. He's accomplished a lot of things. He looks at it and says, what have I accomplished? I may have a wife, I may have a family, but all I've done is work all my life for what? Everyone but me. For everyone's dream but mine. You see, when man comes to the end of all that he does, it's vanity unless it takes him back to God. What was God's purpose? What was God's design? So this brings us to an important question. It's in verse 3. It says, what profit has a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? What profits a man in all of his labor? Now think about that. Because this is what brings people to what we call the midlife crisis. They have labored 
all their life for these things. And you know what they find out? They're just things. It doesn't make sense to them. They're things. They may have brought excitement when I first bought them, but they're just things. So he says, what does it profit? I want you to think about that question for a minute. Because look at all the people that work so hard to accomplish what in their life. What do, what are they trying to buy? What are they trying to get? And so they come to the reality or the realization that what they have has no meaning, no value, no worth. That everything of this world depreciates. And unless it's a rare gem or a rare something, you never get any what you put into it. That's the vanity of things. So the preacher, the philosopher in a way, is asking a very important question. What are you profiting in your labor? You see, there has to be a reason for what we do. There has to be a reason. What does man, first of all, profit from vanity? Well, absolutely nothing. So let me ask you another way, because remember, he asked us in light of vanity. He just got through saying, everything's vanity. So what profits you in your labor? What does your labor profit in the end? Now, that's quite a question. You see, this book is, is written to make you think. To make you consider. To make you look at what you value, what you think is important. The investments you're trying to make. Where is it going to lead you in the end? He wants to bring contrast to you. So, what this looks like is, what does a man profit in this world if it all adds up to vanity? That's what he's asking, really. What does it profit if it all adds up to vanity? There has to be another equation in here for your work to mean something. <laughs> okay? Now, there has to be a reason for it. So let me ask you in another way. What fruits does your vanity produce? That's what it comes down to. Because people, we reap what we sow. So what are you reaping in your pursuits? Now, what does man labor for? That's the question that you have to ask. What does man labor for? Especially if it proves to be vanity in the end. What does he gain in the end if it all turns out to be vanity? Nothing. Now, does that seem like a circle to you? Yes unless you step outside of it. Okay? He's trying to get people to realize that so much of our search in this world is for the world, for the things of the world. Is it really going to profit you after all? It's all about the flesh. Is it going to profit you after all? There has to be more. And there has to be a point where we get beyond that more. So what have you labored for? How has it benefited you? 
What has it done for others? <gasps> others? Well, you know, I did this all for my family. No, you did it for you. Okay? And according to the world, what have you gained? According to the world, what have you gained? Accomplishments? Uh, what? Rewards, certificates, what? You know, we were, uh, we sit among some pretty amazing people that have gained some incredible things in their life. Titles, positions. We sit among them. But you know what it comes down to? No one else cares. No one else cares, really. No one cares. So you got all these positions out there. You got all this recognition out there. I don't really care. You know why? Because it did touch my life. So why would I care? If it didn't affect my life, why would I care? That's the question. So, there has to be a reason man labors. Now, prophets depend on what? Here's the big one. On the type of fruit your life produces. The type of fruit your life produces. You are known by your fruits. Your source, your life, is known by fruits that you produce. Now we know what Matthew 7, 16, and 20 tell us, but my question today is how many prefer and seek out your type of fruit? Do you know how many people are seeking out good fruit? When people go through to the grocery store, they're looking for the best, tastiest fruit they can get because that's what they're willing to pay for. What about your life? What did Jesus ask in Luke 9, 24, 25? Go there with me. Luke 9. You have to excuse me as people know I have a voice problem, but uh, I'm asking God to not let anything shut me up when it comes to the scriptures. Luke 9, 24, 25. This is probably <clears throat> one of the greatest statements. You can read this in more than Luke chapter 9, but it's a good one. 24, 25 says, For whosoever will save his life, this is where he calls us to discipleship, shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake, the same shall find it. This is what Jesus says. For what is a man advantage if he gains the whole world and lose himself or be a castaway? And what scripture says, what does a man profit? If he gains the whole world but loses his soul. What does a man profit when he gains the vanity of this world? What ha has he, what does he have to do? People, he has to sell his soul to gain the vanity of this world. And it's still vanity. Think about that question. They still end up with nothing. What about the flesh protecting the vanity of this world? What are they protecting of? The seeds of death. 
which have been sown into this world, it ends with death. And yet we pursue it. The philosopher would ask one particular area, what profit has man laboring in, in this world to look forward to? What does a man laboring in this world has to look forward to? We need to answer that question. To nothing? To their lot in life? So you would say, why work? Why labor? There's nothing in it. We have a whole generation coming up. That's a nanny state mentality. Give me, give me, give me, give me. Because I don't think I should have to work for it. It means nothing to them. Nothing means nothing to them because they have never learned value because they never had to work for anything. It's been handed to them by very foolish parents who needed to say at one point, no, you need to earn that. No, you need to work for that. You need to understand the value that everything you get, someone is sacrificed for. Why do, why do our young people need to be, understand sacrifice? Because they will have nothing without sacrifice. Why do we need to understand that? Because the greatest sacrifice it what is what affords us salvation today. It's the sacrifice of Christ. He could not offer us redemption without sacrifice. If you don't teach your children that a lot of times it comes to sacrifice, they will never learn the value of anything. including the sacrifice of Christ. You see, what you have as a young person costs your parents. What you gain will cost you. Now we come down to this reality about how people look at work, at laboring. It comes down to the type of investment you're making. The first thing we have to consider is what are you laboring for? Note, it is the labor in the world because he makes reference to it laboring under the sun. So he's actually really making a reference to laboring under the sun. Which, if, if you're a farmer, you understand that better than anybody. If you're a rancher, you understand that. If you depend on weather in any way, you understand that to somewhat of a degree. So it comes back to this world. Laboring, you have to remember when the preacher wrote this, most people had to grow their own food. Boy, People don't understand that today. It took a whole day for some of the women to prepare meals. Okay, they didn't have stoves. They labored people. They labored. Okay. Now if you were a king, you didn't labor, but everybody else labored. There was much laboring going on. If you were a slave, you labored. And you labored seven days a week, usually. So, did they understand laboring in that day? Yes, they did. What are you laboring for? For most people, it was planting seeds, cultivating them, growing them to make sure there was a yield. 
they could sell, they could barter with. Now there are two types of seed that we plant, for there are different fields and terrain, pointing to different fruit, of course. But we must remember this, the land that gives us food has been cursed. Genesis three seventeen through 19. Why has it been cursed? It's called sin. And what I want you to know today, you're laboring under sin. You're laboring under a curse. You're laboring under a world that is doomed. That's why it's vanity. Okay? But nevertheless, we have to labor. The body, the flesh, will fall aside in due time. You have to realize that mortal man is always walking towards his demise. But a Christian, a believer, is walking towards that time they step through the door into eternal life and the flesh falls to the wayside. So you say, why labor? Well, because we must labor to eat. This world systems are not offering us a free ride. We'd like to think so. Well, you know, it's offering me this and that, yes, but the wages of is death. It's not free. The wages of sin is death. It's not free. Don't ever think anything's free. It's going to require something out of you. It's going to require something from you. Don't forget that. We are basically serfs here. I want you to look at 1 Thessalonians 3.10 with me. Paul is uh, very clear about this. 1 Timothy 3.10. I mean, for, yeah, 1 Thessalonians, thank you. I'm looking at Timothy, that's got me off. 1 Thessalonians 3.10. Uh, am I looking at the right one? No. I'll tell you what it says, and I'll have to find it. It says, if you don't work, you don't eat. <laughs> huh? If you don't work, you don't eat. There were people trying to say, well, I don't have to work. But he's saying, if you don't work, you don't eat. They were waiting for Jesus to come. They felt he was going to come, so they sit and serve on the mountain. And he says, you don't get it. It doesn't work that way. Let me see if I find it here. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's in Second Thessalonians. That's where I went wrong. 3.10, it says, For even when you were with you, this we commanded, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but our busy bodies. Wow, that's in Second Thessalonians. If you don't work, you don't eat. See, you have to be willing to earn your food. Work for it. Labor for it. People do not owe you a free ride. The only thing that's free to us is salvation.
but it came at the great sacrifice of Christ. But past that freedom of receiving salvation, we are to work it out with fear and trembling. There's a work that goes into it. The Bible's very clear that there are works that accompany salvation. Yes, it's free to you. But if I give you a gift that's to be used, you have to use that gift. You have to maintain that gift. And salvation is a free gift. You cannot neglect. You have to work it out. You have to have that life of Christ worked in you. Now we labor to reap, we labor to establish our lifestyle, we labor to function in the flesh. Without laboring, we can't really live in this world. That's the reality of it. It doesn't matter if it's sort of vanity. We do get some things from it, like being able to function. But you have to work. The thing I want you to understand is that work is a privilege, not a right. You can go into some societies, you don't have a privilege to work. They'll tell you what to do. They'll put you in the dump. They'll put you wherever they want. You don't have that right to go in there and do what you want. And that's what our me, myself generation acts like. I have a right to work wherever I want, do whatever I want. That's a bunch of baloney. You earn your way into positions because you have to have experiences, and rightfully so. It's not handed to you. That workplace is not your mommy and daddy. Time to grow up and be responsible. Take your reins. There are responsibilities. People often fail to realize that working has conduct, I, I should say, constructive work gives purpose to the soul and feelings of accomplishment. Purpose to the soul and feelings of accomplishment. It says a lot about your character in a way. The problem with man is if he lacks initi initiative, he sees no reason to work. If he's lazy, he will not feel like working. But he's often forced to work to function in this world because mommy and daddy's not always going to be able to hand you the money. And our government is not going to continue to hand you the money either. There comes a day of reckoning. And for a lot of these young, lazy slobs that sit in their basement behind their computers, it's coming like a locomotive. And they're not prepared to do a blasted thing except sit there, suck their thumb, and hope that their computer will be their pacifier the rest of their life. Now, we have examples here, okay? There are reasons we labor in this world I want you to consider what Genesis 2.15 says. And the Lord God took the man, Adam, and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Now what are we talking about here? Adam was in a perfect environment. He had to dress it and keep it? What did that mean? Did God say, okay, Adam, you're going to do here, do nothing but stare at creation? He said, no, you got to dress and keep this garden. It's a perfect environment. What do you have to dress and keep? We live in a cursed world. Adam lived in paradise. And yet he's given two 
main responsibilities. Two, and it was to labor. It had some laboring in it. So what about these responsibilities? What was God telling man to do? You have to realize that working has a responsibility because it serves as a means to an end. Working serves as a means to an end. There's a reason, there's a purpose for working. So we see that this first man was given two responsibilities. Now, what were they? Dress points to service. People, we are to labor in service. We are to serve. We're not here to be served. That's why we're missing it. We think it's all about us. We think that all of this stuff that we are told we need is going to bring us happiness and it brings us nothing because we think it's about us. Dress is about serving. In what way was Adam to serve? What was the service to and what was it for? Please hear me. He was given the responsibility to what? To render service to God in that garden. He was to render service to God Almighty who deserves to be served. Man does not. In what way could he render service, worship, praise? You know the other way he could render service? Protect his relationship with God. That would take everything to protect his relationship with God to make sure nothing would disturb that perfect environment where he could walk with God. That was his highest possible calling, and it's still our calling. We're here to render service to God Almighty. That is the one labor that will never be done in vanity. That's the one investment that goes on forever and ever and ever. What does keep mean? Keep means to guard. What was he to guard? The integrity of that environment. How much work does it take for you to guard the integrity of your inward being from all the influences of the world around you. It's labor. It's not minor. How has this affected me? What am I coming into agreement with? What am I buying? What am I accepting? How do I maintain the right attitude, the right environment of worship to God Almighty in my life. Hebrews talked about neglecting your salvation. The reason you're neglecting is because you're not guarding it. You're not dressing your life with the things of God. You're not protecting yourself. Adam was to make sure nothing disrupted that harmony between his walk with God. The garden for you and I is our heart. We must guard it. We need to dress our lives in such a way that we will not let anything disrupt the integrity of our service and worship to God. 
I wish I could say I did this all the time. I don't. Because I'm inundated by so much. It's a battle. It's one of the toughest laboring you're going to do. It's spiritual. It's mental. It's physical. It's emotional. It requires your whole being to do that. It's tough. Now, we looked at it, but we considered some of what Paul said in Second Thessalonians 3.10 already. But let's look at that again, because he says a lot more there. This time I got it right. The first time I didn't. But I want you to look at what is some of the things he said. We're going to begin in verse 10 again. For even when we were with you, this we commanded that if you would not work, neither should you eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly. When people are not working constructive, they're disorderly. What else are they? They're busybodies. Getting involved with other people's lives when they should be doing what's right. Let's go on and see what else they were doing. Uh, now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But you, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man. We're to note those people who are lazy and will not work. We're not to enable them and support them. And that goes for our kids that should be out working. Okay? They say, well, I can't find a job in my area. Then go and wash dishes and learn what it means to work. Start from the bottom. Learn what it means to earn. So it says, note that man and have what? No company with him. That he may be ashamed. Our young people that we allow to sit in our stupid basements and whatever else because of this or that. We should be ashamed. We haven't taught them to work. Because you know what we've done? We have produced a society of nothing. Our nation will fall because our young people do not understand sacrifice, work, laboring, earning, realizing they're going to reap what they sow. He goes on to say, yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. We shouldn't be admonishing our young people for not working. And a shame we haven't taught them how to work. Colossians 3.23 really helps us to keep in mind why any of us do anything. You call yourself a Christian? You call yourself a believer? This tells you why whatever we do is never going to be counted as vain. But listen to what it says. Colossians 3.23 And whatsoever you do, notice you do, the smallest thing, the biggest thing, whatsoever you do, do it hardly as to the Lord 
and not unto men. That's the only way you're going to keep the integrity of any of your laboring. Now, as believers, we must do all things unto the Lord to make sure our labor counts is not counted worthless. This means doing right before him as a witness, doing right to others in order to point them heavenward. Whether it is in service in this world, service to God, all things must be unto him for his glory to keep our laboring in this world from proving to be what? Done in vain. Done in vain. So when we leave this world for the next, we actually leave an en enduring testimony that always points man heavenward. 